Oh, Karen, Tim needs to be unmuted. Oh, oh dear. Can he? I think he can unmute him. I don't think so, the way we set it up. Here he is. Okay. I yeah. just unmuted. So right. you're going first, correct, Helen? Yes. But the others should keep themselves muted. Or we'll mute you. Yeah. So go ahead. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Ellen Corcella, and I'm one of the, I guess, uh, members of Theology and Peace. Uh, we're really glad to have you here. And we're really glad to have as our speaker, uh, Pastor Adam Erickson. Uh, he is pastor of Clackamas uh, Christian. It's United Church of Christ, right? In um, Oregon. Um, let me say a couple of things about the organization of theology and peace before we give a full introduction to Adam. Um, this group was founded in 2007 by a group of pastors who joined sort of in coalition with scholars from a academic group known as the Colloquium on Violence and Religion. Uh, and they wanted to bring um, to bear what is known as the mimetic theory of Rene Girard to kind of a wider audience of pastors, practitioners, theologians, peace and justice activists. So what our group does as sort of a smaller version of the academic group is we try to go from the theoretical application to thinking about practical applications of uh, nonviolence through a mimetic lens. Uh, and we do this with an emphasis on the prophetic dimensions of mimetic theory, trying to understand how violence uh, impacts our world and how the church and activists uh, and those with good hearts can respond. A few years after it was started, uh, the organization began to take racism and the church's response to it very seriously, forging a connection with the newborn community in Baltimore, Maryland. Theology and Peace sponsors a contributing theologian, a position held by, had a uh, contributing theologian at the time, a position held in the past by Dr. Anthony Bartlett, an Episcopal priest and co-founder of the Bethany Center for Nonviolence, Theology and Spirituality, and by Dr. Paul Neuterland, a Lutheran pastor and host of the online Girardian lectionary. What we also do is put on an annual conference with well-known speakers, and we've hosted such people as Brian McLaren, Naomi Tutu, the daughter of South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And during the global pandemic year, our group partnered with the sister organization, the Raven Foundation, of whom Adam and several of the attendees are uh, with to produce the Collaborators Conference online. As the world emerged out of the pandemic, theology and peace has continued to its work by entering, as you can see, the Zoom era. Um, this year, we decided to initiate a regular quarterly online speaker series to supplement that online, that annual in-person gathering. Uh, we hope you will continue to join us for these quarterly speakers series. If you would like, you're sort of on our email list because you've uh, added yourself to this event, but if you would like to join our mailing list or have others, visit our website at theologyandpeace.org um, and look at the website for further information. Now, what we will do tonight is uh, Adam will speak uh, on the topic he has chosen for the evening. When he has finished the speech um, or even during the time he is talking, feel free to put some questions in the chat messaging feature I will be monitoring the chat and I will propose those questions directly to Adam. Sometimes if two questions are very similar, I might not e ask each separately. I'll try to combine the, the questions which have the same uh, emphasis uh, for um, efficiency purposes. Um, and then uh, Adam will have a chance to answer those questions. Or if you wish to make other comments about Adam's conversation, 
please also enter those in the chat feature. We are doing this just to make this a more efficient and smooth way to let everybody have a chance to uh, speak. I would be remiss if I did not remind you that this year our annual gathering will be just outside Chicago. Um, and it will take place from October 5th through the 8th at Casa Iscali Retreat Center. And it will feature Adam Erickson, who you will hear tonight, and Sharon uh, Putt, our guest, uh, who speaks about salvation and atonement theory. She draws from her new book, A Nonviolent Theology of Love, Peacefully Confessing the Apostles' Creed. We will also have uh, panels, uh, workshops, and what may be the best feature of all, a chance for all of us to get to know each other and to talk to each other about our matters of interest. So Tim, I hand it over to you. Okay. Well, the moment has arrived. I uh, introduce with joy my brother, Adam Erickson. And uh, in his bio, I want to now go to uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, where he earned his master's. And then he joined uh, the Raven Foundation as their education director. Um, at Raven, he focused on connecting mimetic theory, which uh, Ellen just referenced, to the nonviolence and love of God. Uh, at Raven, they do blogs and in the past videos and had a weekly radio interview program. And by the way, I believe some of that's still present on uh, YouTube and other places, so look that up. Uh, while he was working at uh, Raven, he was also the youth pastor at First Congregational Church of Wilmette. And if I'm remembering correctly, you also did some very excellent um, youth curriculum that kind of uh, brought that to that level. And so tonight, and by the way, his topic is preaching, teaching, and living. Yes, nonviolent Christianity. Um, when working with these youth, he observed what was important to them. He's an outstanding listener, and he can... Uh, communicated his uh, communication style. Then uh, he left uh, Chicago and moved back to Oregon in 2018, where he became the full-time pastor of a special church where we have the prayer group, some of them tonight, Clackamas United Church of Christ. I hope to visit one day. To build visibility, Adam has encouraged his church to purchase a marquee letter sign where profoundly Christian yet witty and um, engaging uh, sayings appear weekly, bringing him and his congregation attention from major publications such as Newsweek, USA Today, Sojourners, plus local television and radio stations. Then I, his children challenged him to create a TikTok channel, which he now uh, masters and engages with individuals near and far. His visibility and messages have brought additional members to his congregation, both in the pews and online, which has encouraged the forming of unexpected partnerships, which I hope he will refer to some of those. They've been incredible that are designed to care for and support others in need. Uh, Adam, we're really glad to have you here tonight. And uh, if you can uh, start us off, and since you're used to it this time, uh, with your prayer group from your congregation, you're also welcome to pray, even as I'm coveting your my neighbor's clergy caller. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, people sometimes ask me how I got this clergy collar, and it's just a uh, rainbow ribbon from Michael's uh, taped on there. So <laughs> that's the big secret for the rainbow collar. So uh, Tim messaged me 
uh, now I can't get it back in. There we go. Tim messaged me, emailed me a couple weeks ago about um, a chat GP, GP, what is it? What is that thing? Chat GP2. Uh, Chat GPT four, which is an AI, thing. Uh, an artificial intelligence thing, which there's uh, another um, Oregonian that I had to connect you to, Paul Japel, if you don't know. Oh, him. good. Well, yeah. Tim sent that to me, and he asked the chat uh, to do like a paper on the intricacies of mimetic theory and theology, and I was like, "This is amazing." <laughs> After reading it, and I thought, after I finished my presentation today, I thought, I wonder if I could ask chat to uh, make my presentation today to all of you. But you get me today, everybody, not the chat. So here we go. Uh, this is usually the time when uh, I'm going to, uh, Tim, uh, no, Wes, I will explain my tattoo. Okay, yes, uh, I'll do that too. This is usually the time when I have our prayer group uh, on Thursdays from four to five on uh, Pacific time. Uh, so I'm out here in Portland. Um, so I've got a lot. Shout out to uh, all the people at the prayer group. And uh, we do Bible studies on Tuesdays and a chat on Mondays. So this is an open invitation to any of you who uh, want to join us for any of those. Just sign up for the email at Clackamas United Church of Christ. Um, so yeah, as Tim said, I uh, also work at the Raven Foundation. And uh, Raven uh, founders, uh, Suzanne and Keith Ross have started Unrival, uh, another organization uh, from the Ross family that is doing fantastic work. So uh, check them out at unrival.com for more mimetic theory uh, stuff in practical ways that it works out, non-rivalrous ways. So, But uh, let's open up with a word of prayer, and uh, then we will uh, we'll continue. So I invite you to take a deep breath with me. Close your eyes if you'd like, and let us pray. Blessed are you, our God. You form us in your image, and you call us forth to be a blessing. Open our hearts and our minds to your word, your word that was made flesh and that is made flesh your word that is always present with us, reminding us of your eternal love for us, your eternal love for even those that we call our enemies. We pray that you open us up to seeing your radical, nonviolent love that continues to pursue a more just and peaceful world. Open our hearts and our minds to your message today. In your many names we pray. Amen. All right, so a few things to get out of the way first. Uh, okay, uh, Wes asked for uh, the tattoo. So this is a tattoo that I got a couple of years ago. This is actually about good, no, the day between Good Friday and Easter Sunday is Holy Saturday. And in Christian tradition, uh, there's this ancient tradition that says that Jesus on Holy Saturday went down to Hades, to hell, uh, trampled down all of the gates, stormed in and defeated death and Satan, and dragged Adam. Uh, that's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me right there. That's Adam uh, and all of humanity out of hell with him. Uh, we generally think that uh, universal salvation is a modern idea, uh, but actually it's rooted deep in Christian tradition, going all the way back, uh, some say, uh, to the New Testament. I would say that that's true too. Um, so uh, that's what my tattoo is about. And I was going through a time where I felt like I was in hell and very depressed. And I had this book called Christ the Conqueror of Hell. Um, that I read and it was fantastic, but more than like what was inside the book, <laughs> more than the chapters was the image on the front cover, which was this, a 10th century uh, fresco uh, in Turkey. Uh, and I had it on my desk and I was like, I want to carry that with me wherever I go, because it reminds me that uh, when I'm in my depressed states, that Christ is there with me. Uh, and 
it was just an amazing, amazing thing. So I wanted to get that on my arm. So that's the story of the tattoo, Wes. Thank you for opening that up. And Tim said that uh, I have had unexpected partnerships at the church. And that is true. Probably the most unexpected partnership at the church after started posting the signs was, um, some of you may not know this, <laughs> but Portland, Oregon uh, has the most uh, strip clubs per capita in the United States. Uh, strip clubs are to Portland, Oregon, like um, football stadiums are to Texas. Uh, so you learned something new today. How about that? <laughs> That's awesome. So I started posting these uh, signs up on our social media and uh, a stripper from Portland started sending me messages uh, about how much she was not a Christian. She did not believe in God, but she loved what we were doing and our message. And we started messaging back and forth. And you may remember four or five years ago when uh, ICE went to a chicken factory in Alabama, I think it was, and uh, uh, got some uh, of our undocumented uh, siblings uh, out of there and sent them away, leaving uh, children stranded. And so the strippers heard this and said, hey, I want to do a fundraiser for these children so that we can get lawyers uh, in uh, Alabama or Arkansas or wherever it was to help these children and their families reunite. And I said, that sounds amazing. How can my church help? So we did a fundraiser. They did a fundraiser. And uh, that was an unexpected partnership. Um, so that was fun. Thank you for uh, asking that, Tim. Uh, so friends, uh, you hopefully got uh, my ebook, uh, Unlearning the Bible. Uh, I think that you all got that for registering for this event. If you are watching this recording, you can go to my website, adamerickson.org, and you can download it there. But uh, I wanted to talk with you a little bit um, about that, and I'm going to share my screen as we get into this. Let's see here. Here we go. All right, it's loading. Let's go. Let's load. There we go. So, this uh, this is my ebook, Unlearning uh, the Bible, Unlearn the Bible, and one of the key passages that or points that I want to make stems from actually an email uh, that I got recently with a question that I frequently get, which is, "I'm uncomfortable with the Bible. Where do I start?" right? Uh, you've probably heard this all frequently. Uh, people also ask, what uh, version of the Bible should I get? Uh, and I've started to think about this in a little bit different way, because I think that more than the version of the Bible, uh, there are some versions that are better than others, uh, and where to start uh, is, may sound obvious, I hope to many of you now, but is with Jesus. And before we get into it, I want you to know that the good news here is that I am completely unoriginal. Uh, my ego kind of hurts when I say that, but I want you to know that I am not making this up. I have uh, family members uh, who tell me that I am making up a new religion uh, with the things that I am about to tell you, but I am not. Uh, this form of Christianity goes back to ancient Christian theologians. And if you want to learn more about this, here is a list of books that I recommend uh, that will help you do this. I am going to uh, <laughs> emphasize those books here uh, that are in bold, especially this book, uh, The Joshua Delusion uh, by Douglas Earle. Uh, it is going to, it blew my mind and I think it will blow yours too. So uh, James Allison, Forgiving Victim, uh, Jesus, the forgiving victim, and Brad Jersak, a more Christ-like God and a more Christ-like uh, word have also been really helpful for me. Uh, we've mentioned Paul Nectarline. Uh, Paul's Girardian Reflections on the Lectionary is one of the best free resources out there uh, if you're wanting more information on this. so uh, But let's just get right to it. So we are not Biblians, friends. We are Christians. The Bible is important, but we are not people of the book. We are people of the word made flesh. This means that the Bible is important in as much 
as for Christians, as the Bible points beyond itself to Christ. Uh, this was one of the key points of one of the major theologians of the 20th century, Karl Barth, uh, who said that the Bible is important, but it points beyond itself to Christ. Uh, Christ is our interpretive key. Uh, you know that in John chapter 1, uh, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, uh, and the Word became a book. No, that's not what it says. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? This is the essence of the Christian story, is that we are people of the Word made flesh. Jesus had a specific way of interpreting uh, his scriptures. Uh, one of the interesting points uh, that Jesus makes is in a debate with uh, some Pharisees uh, about divorce. And uh, they come to him and say, why did Moses command us to give uh, a wife a, a dismissal of a divorce to her? And Jesus says, that wasn't Moses, that was God right? Because it's written in the word of God. No, he says, it was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wife. So here we get a nuance of how Jesus is interpreting the Bible. And this is typical of ancient teachers of the Jewish world, ancient rabbis. They would debate uh, the Bible. They would debate passages. Uh, is the, are these the words of Moses? Are these the words of God? Are these the words of Isaiah? Are these they would they would tease that out? And here Jesus is teasing that out, nuancing uh, what the Bible is saying. So apparently there are some parts of the Bible that are the word of God, maybe, and there are other points, other parts of the Bible that are the words of Moses, are the words of Joshua. Uh, this is a, a Jesus is teaching us as a teacher, a rabbi, how to tease this out. Uh, Jesus says uh, in other places uh, that God desires mercy and not sacrifice. He is quoting the prophet Hosea there. Uh, it's not as if uh, Jesus says God desires mercy and a little bit of sacrifice here and there just to appease God's wrath, right? No. It's God desires mercy, steadfast love, and not sacrifice. So uh, today I wanted to talk with you about the problem of violence in the Bible. Uh, with the question, is the problem of violence in the Bible a modern phenomenon? Or uh, is the problem of violence in the Bible something that Christians have struggled with from the very beginning? Uh, many people think that it is only modern Christians who struggle with the violence in the Bible. And the pre-modern people were like, whatever, <laughs> um, it's the Bible says what it says. And so God must have wanted this violence to happen. Uh, actually, that's not the case when you look at history. Uh, our ancient Christian siblings, many of them were also uncomfortable with the Bible, the Bible's violence. In fact, one of the earliest Christians was a man named Marcion, uh, and he lived from 85 to 160 AD, claimed to be a disciple of uh, John, the author of the Gospel of John. And the question was, uh, how could a loving God uh, of Jesus be the same God of the violence of the Old Testament? Uh, and Marcion's answer was to say uh, that there were actually multiple gods. <laughs> and the God of the Old Testament, the God of creation, was a lesser God, uh, a more evil God. And the God of Jesus is the high God. Uh, and uh, the high God came in the form of Jesus to save us from uh, the evil of the lesser God who made the material world. And so the whole point for Marcion is for us to escape the material world because it's evil. Uh, and so that we can move up to heaven in a spiritual realm. 
Well, the early church didn't like this idea in part because they liked Genesis chapter one, uh, where it says that creation is good. They wanted to hold on to Genesis chapter one. Uh, the other problem with Marcion is that he created the first canon of scripture. Uh, he got rid of all of the Old Testament because he thought that was the evil God. And then uh, he only kept parts of the gospel of Luke and some of Paul's or Paul's epistles. Uh, the early church deemed Marcion a heretic, uh, but the church knew that Marcion was on to something important. And that was this whole question about God and violence. What are we going to do in light of Jesus's revelation to us that God is love in first John four, eight and 16. And uh, the revelation that Jesus gives that God is light and in God, there is no darkness at all. How are we going to understand violence in the Bible when Jesus reveals that God is nonviolent love? When Jesus says, that if you want to know what the Father, what God is like, to look to him. Early Christians came up with different solutions to this. One of them is the Alexandrian school of Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, interestingly, there was a man named Philo there who was a rabbi. Uh, he was Jewish. Uh, he lived around the time that Jesus did, overlapped with Jesus, and Philo also had problems with uh, violence in the Bible, and he came up with a allegorical interpretation. What allegory means is that uh, the literal understanding or reading of scripture, uh, especially when it comes to violence, is not the intended meaning or not the most important meaning of the Bible. It's not what we're supposed to get out of it. So this is Philo's way of dealing with violence in the Bible. There's a deeper spiritual meaning in it. So Philo would look to, you can read Philo's uh, book on Genesis, and you can read there all kinds of allegorical interpretations, including the flood. So Philo would say that the flood, the deeper spiritual meaning of the flood is much like uh, how many Christians have interpreted it, away from an actual flood uh, that kills people and towards a deeper spiritual meaning of a washing away of, um, of sin, a washing away of the uh, things inside of us that lead to hostility, that lead to the violence that we, the human violence that we see within the story of uh, of the flood story. Uh, the problem is human violence. So the allegorical interpretation would be that here comes this uh, water that is going to wash away our hostilities within us, within me. That's an example of an allegorical interpretation of uh, violence in the Bible. Uh, Philo uh, was Jewish and uh, the rabbis didn't pay much attention to Philo, but the Christians certainly did. <laughs> the Christians loved Philo. Uh, Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Gregory of Nyssa, John Cassian, uh, all of these, well, Origen uh, was deemed a heretic for reasons that we can get into uh, later if you want to ask questions about that. But the rest of these people all took allegorical interpretations of the Bible following uh, what Philo was up to. And they interpreted the violence in the Bible allegorically. Uh, Origen influenced all of these uh, later Christians to interpret this way. Origen claimed that we need to continue interpreting scripture until we find a meaning worthy of God. What is the meaning that is worthy of God? The meaning that's worthy of God is the meaning that we would find if Jesus is our rabbi. If Jesus is the one who is uh, teaching us how to read scripture, uh, Jesus is the one who goes to the cross and has violence inflicted upon him and refuses to uh, respond with violence of his own. That, if you, if you remember anything from this talk, I hope that that is it. That Jesus reveals who the Father is. The Father, God, 
whatever you want to call the divine, is the one who loves you, loves humanity so much that we could, humans could kill God in the flesh. And how does God respond? On the cross, Father, forgive them. In the resurrection, he comes to those who abandoned him, betrayed him, and says, peace be with you. That is what God is like. That is the revelation of Jesus. That's where you get the message that God is love. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So what do you do with the wrath of God that we see in the Bible? <laughs> St. John Cassian, living in the 4th and 5th century, says this about God's wrath. Uh, just before, uh, it's this is in his book, uh, Institutes, book 8.4. Well, in book 8.3, uh, Cassian talks about uh, God's, uh, the Bible often talks about God's mouth, speaking from God's mouth or God's arms, uh, refers to God's body in some ways, like God is listening and things like that. Cassian says, you can't take that literally uh, because God is spirit. And so you have to take that metaphorically or allegorically. Uh, and so John Cassian says this right away after talking about metaphorically about God's body. Uh, Cassian says this, and so as without horrible profanity, these things cannot be understood literally of him who is declared by the authority of Holy Scripture to be invisible, ineffable, incomprehensible, is inestable, simple, and uncompounded. So neither can the passion of anger and wrath be attributed to the unchangeable nature without fearful blasphemy. What Cassian is saying here is to interpret the wrath of God in the Bible literally is blasphemy. Have you ever heard this before? <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I haven't before this last year, before I started studying the ancient church theologians more and more. To interpret wrath literally and attribute it to God is blasphemy, according to St. John Cassian. So what do you do with uh, violence in the Bible? What do you do with this wrath language? How do you how do you interpret it more metaphorically? Uh, the Joshua Delusion by Douglas Earl uh, has some really interesting answers from the ancient Christian world. Uh, he talks about something that many of us, I'm sure, on this call uh, here today, uh, are very uncomfortable with, which is God's uh, seemingly seeming call to those who are entering into the promised land to uh, acts of genocide against the Canaanites. Now, some Christians uh, will interpret this literally. God literally wanted uh, the people of God to kill the Canaanites and commit genocide. Why? Because the Canaanites were somehow horrible, awful people, and they deserved it. That's one way of interpreting it. Uh, another one is that God just commands you to do what God commands you to do, and God is holy and just, and who are you to question what God wants uh, to have happen? Interestingly, uh, that argument falls flat because Abraham argues with God. People argue with God all throughout the Bible. Uh, so uh, one of the early ways of understanding this passage, this example of divine violence in the Bible, is allegorically. Uh, Douglas Earl says that pre-moderns were led to people before the 15th, 16th century were led to understand texts like these, the genocide in Joshua is having their real meaning somewhere other than the literal or plain sense of the text. The real meaning is not in the literal or plain sense of the text. The level where the ethical and historical difficulties are located, the ethical and historical difficulties in a text cues the reader to the text to seek the significance of the text in a spiritual sense. He goes on to say, what is interesting here is that Origen's non-literal approach to the text operated precisely in contrast to the interpretive practices of the Gnostic heretics including Marcion, who we talked about earlier, who asserted that the Old Testament must be understood literally. 
Marcion's problem, what made Marcion a heretic, according to the early church, was that he had a literal interpretation of the violence in the Bible, which led him to reject the Bible because he, the Old Testament, because he took it literally. We have problems with the violence in the Bible, and the ancient Christians are showing us how to interpret that violence, how to deal with that violence by pointing towards an allegorical or a spiritual understanding of that violence. So what is that uh, interpretation? What is that allegorical interpretation? They would say that inside of each of us are uh, evil forces. Uh, the Canaanites are inside of you and inside of me. And Joshua is dealing with our ego sense, uh, our pride, uh, our um, anger, our wrath uh, inside of each of us. Those are the Canaanites inside of us. And Joshua is in us too. And uh, how are we going to support Joshua in helping us overcome those uh, elements within ourselves. That's that's an example of the spiritual or allegorical interpretation that uh, ancient Christians, Origen, John Cassian, and others would um, would bring forth. So how did we how did we get here? How did the early Christians get here? Uh, this is where uh, two of my favorite theologians today come in, uh, Brad Jersak and James Allison. Uh, they talk about the Emmaus way. Uh, and this is where Jesus gives an interpretation, uh, helps us by providing an interpret the, a way of interpreting the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and also the New Testament as well. Uh, Jesus, this is a uh, resurrection appearance, and he comes to uh, two disciples who are on the road to Emmaus, and they are uh, struggling because Jesus has just died. This is the person that they have put their trust in for the last three years of their lives, and he is dead, uh, and they are feeling hopeless. And Jesus comes to them. They don't recognize him. And Jesus says to them, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in scripture. The early Christians uh, understood this to mean that there are uh, Christ-like figures in the Hebrew scriptures. And so our job, uh, reading this Christianly as, as Christians, uh, according to many of the ancient theologians, would be to use our imaginations to find where Christ is located in the Hebrew scriptures. They would say, uh, many of them, including Origen, would say, unless you have gotten to this point of interpreting the Bible, uh, you haven't interpreted it. <laughs> you haven't gotten to the deeper spiritual sense of the Bible. Jesus, the one who on the cross says, Father, forgive them. Jesus, the one who in the resurrection says, no words of vengeance, but offers words of peace. Uh, one way that you can interpret or that Jesus teaches us to interpret, is that in John 16, uh, he says, Indeed, an hour is coming when those who kill you will think that they are offering worship to God. This is Jesus's understanding of um, religious violence. People think that they are offering worship to God when they kill someone in the name of God, or people think that they are doing God's will when they use violence or exclusion uh, against others. People think this, but they're not. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus reveals to us a God who is radical, nonviolent love. Uh, John 10.10 10 also says that the thief comes only to steal and destroy, but Jesus came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Why is this important to our uh, interpretation or understanding of scripture, because it is the thief, you might call it uh, Satan, the devil, um, you might call it um, our own impulses uh, to uh, overcome others. Um, but the thief 
is the one who comes to steal and destroy. That's what the thief does. That's not what God does. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So this is an interpretive key for us to understand that if you see divine uh, violence in the Bible, somebody who comes to steal and destroy other peoples, that that is not God. That is, that is the thief because Jesus, the word made flesh, came that they might have life. So where in scripture uh, do we find Christ? Where do we find this acting out? Where do we find divine, uh, somebody acting in divine violence against another in the name of God? I'm sure that you can find examples on your own. And I'm sure that you can come up with many of them. Uh, James Allison does this brilliantly in his book, Jesus, the Forgiving Victim. I highly recommend it if you're interested in more on this. Uh, he tells the story in Joshua chapter 7 of uh, Joshua and Achan. Achan is accused of stealing um, uh, idols uh, on their way to the promised land. And uh, Achan, uh, they end up casting lots and finding out that it's Achan uh, who has stolen uh, the idols. In reality, probably everybody, uh, many of them have stolen idols, right? But the lots fall on Achan and they end up killing uh, Achan's, Achan, stoning him to death and Achan's family uh, and Achan's uh, animals. And so the question becomes, who is the Christ-like figure in this? Who is the one who takes religious violence upon himself? Who is the one who is killed while other people are thinking that they are doing the will of God and worshiping God? Achan in this story is the Christ figure, uh, not Joshua, who is the one who is persecuting and causing violence. This also, you can see this in the New Testament as well. Uh, many of you are familiar with Acts chapter 5 uh, and Ananias and Sapphira, uh, and it's an interesting way of uh, interpreting this passage because Ananias and Sapphira uh, end up holding uh, money back from the early community. Uh, they sold a piece of property and they hold money back and uh, they end up getting found out and uh, they are seized with uh, fear once they are found out and then they die. <laughs> they just kind of fall down. Uh, now, if you are like me, you have been trained to interpret, oh, God must have killed them, right? Uh, but it doesn't say that. Uh, it just says that they fell down and died. This is one of the ways that we've been trained to attribute divine violence to God when it's not in the text. So much of the Bible has a secularization of divine violence, but we've been trained to add God into the text of violence um, when God isn't there. Uh, so uh, the truth about violence in the Bible is that the Bible reveals the truth about what it means to be God and also what it means to be human. There is a truth about being human that we project our violence onto God. Uh, Jesus' statement that there will come a day when they kill you and they think that they are doing worship uh, is something that is true about being human. You could replace the worshiping God part with almost anything else. There will come a day when they kill you and they think that they are doing an act of justice. There will come a day when they kill you and they think that this is the one that's most likely. They think that they are doing an act of peace by killing you, by killing your enemies. You can secularize that statement and come to the same truth. Uh, but that is the truth of, one of the truths of being human, is that we tend to project our violence uh, onto something else, either God or justice or peace or revenge, uh, and don't take responsibility for it for ourselves. But Jesus reveals that violence uh, is the human will. It was humans, according to the book of Acts, who killed Jesus, putting him on the cross. And God 
brought Jesus to life. Not to seek revenge, but to offer words of peace that we might live in a more just and loving world. God's desire is for mercy, not sacrifice, not violence. And so uh, I hope in this far too quick <laughs> presentation about the Bible and violence that I have given you uh, some interest in following up on uh, the ancient theologians, because it's not it's not just us moderns uh, who might have soft hearts <laughs> that are concerned with violence in the Bible. It's Christians throughout history who have been concerned with violence in the Bible, who have been concerned with divine violence and have found different ways of interpreting it. So uh, hope I have... Um, given you some uh, good info here and uh, would be happy to open up for any comments, uh, questions that you would uh, like to go over uh, from this presentation. So thank you. Oh, Ellen, you're muted. Yeah, thank there you, Adam. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just let everybody take a breath here and, and let some of your wise words sink in. Um, to from the presentation um and i will get to your question there tim it's a very good uh question um uh as the moderator i've learned that i get a little um treat which means i get to troll the person who's going to be speaking um <laughs> so that i know what's up in case somebody throws an oddball question at us so i prepare but i, I didn't find anything oh good, good uh, you're tricky good. on there so, uh, but I've noticed a couple of things. Um, and uh, one is that, uh, I guess the question that's come to me is, we who think what you've just said is is obvious and not only logical, it's, it's uh, the truth. It's a heartfelt truth, right? That God, the God that we follow is a God of love. But we end up having to present that in this current climate as if it's a counter narrative, right? Mm. To the narrative that's out there in the public media on most of the mainstream media through their symbolism, right? You have symbolism behind you uh, and on your collar. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, one, there are good people out there messaging just like you are, Adam, and I hope Theology and Peace is, it is, it's not hope, it is amongst those messaging that. But how do we be heard above the noise so that this message resonates? And I say that knowing that uh, Reverend William Barber's been out there, all sorts of people out there, but you would not know it if you're the ordinary person who is disturbed by what they hear about Christianity. And um, so I was just curious about that. And how do we do it in a loving, a non counter uh, way, right? Where yeah. we develop our own rivalry uh, within the system. And then yeah. we'll go to Tim's question. So no, hope that wasn't great. too. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, and I, I would love to stay on for uh, a lot longer than our allotted time and bring right. uh, Suzanne in on this one who has, uh, um, Suzanne and Keith, who have uh, created uh, Unrival uh, right. to talk with us about the wonderful work that they're doing, um, mm -hmm. reaching across um, political, religious um, divides uh, in order mm -hmm. to answer that very question. It's an incredibly excellent practical example of, of doing just that. I, um, let's see, it's been very difficult for me. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a personal story. Um, one of the, th one of the answers to that, that I have found that's been really helpful is to stick to what you are for and not what you are against. Uh, unfortunately throughout Christian history, even when, uh, it may sound very strange, uh, hopefully not as strange after this presentation for me to say that as a progressive Christian, I um, am also find myself being very orthodox because orthodox, like what I have presented to you 
is orthodoxy right. <laughs> before right. before the Reformation. It's really, as a Protestant, I can say this. You may have seen uh, Douglas Earl where uh, he says, it's really after the Protestant Reformation where it gets off the rails into hyper-literalism uh, mm -hmm. of the text, right? Um, and unfortunately, throughout Christian history, there has been excommunication. There has been, you know, we've we've gone to violent blows over over the Lord's Supper, right? Uh, right. It, tragic, like, um, and so I think that I, for me, uh, just emphasizing staying on the message that God is love and invites us to live in relationships of love, even with those that we uh, call our enemies is not, is important. And at the same time, Jesus shows us that it is not a message of acquiescing to injustice in the world, right? Um, it is, for me, it's always, for me, I try to think of it as Jesus goes to the temple in order to be a spoke in the wheel of unjust systems, just like the prophets did before him. Uh, and so like Paul says, our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with the powers and principalities of the world. So I try to keep it focused on that. Uh, one way is to keep it focused on issues and not on people uh, that are on the other side. Uh, easier said than done. Um, but um, I guess just a, just a quick story is sometimes people will come to my social media and they'll start you know, accusing me of being a heretic and blah, blah, blah. You've all heard it before. And it'll come to a point where I'll say, Hey, why don't the two of our churches get together and we do a fundraiser for the children's hospital in your city. Uh, and they will say, sorry, can't do that because that would make us unequally yoked. <laughs> so I'm like, we can't even work together for a children's hospital. Like surely we can find something that we agree on that is for the good of the world. Um, the good news is that I've recently developed a friendship with a very conservative member uh, in my town, and we have been meeting over coffee and just sharing our life with one another, and we're batting around ideas of how we can help. I'm sure you've heard that the homeless crisis in Portland is one of the worst in the country, so we've started batting around ideas of how we can work together to put a Band-Aid and maybe do a little mm -hmm. bit more about the homeless crisis. So it's it's just, I was losing hope that a progressive mm -hmm. and a conservative could get together to do some good in the world. But now I am gaining hope. And part of what I'm learning is uh, what you all know is that on social media, people um, act out in negative ways uh, more than they would in person. So maybe trying to develop relationships with people on the other side of the whatever spectrum you're on uh, in the flesh uh, is one way to handle that too. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your persistence. This leads us very nicely into Tim's question, which is how do you pray together as your church with your congregation uh, non-violently? Um, and Tim says, it's great you're, and I would say it's great you got your prayer group here with you. So maybe you go to that and I'll be looking at the other questions. Oh, that's a, Tim, I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, I, how do we pray nonviolently? Um, if any of our prayer people would want to come in on that, uh, you can. I would say that I do not, I, I want people to be free to express themselves in prayer um, and what they're feeling to get it out to God, uh, even if it is a violent prayer. Uh, I want God can handle our violent prayers and God knows what to do with our violent prayers. Uh, we were joking before we started going live, uh, sort of joking about the horrible prayer in the Psalm about uh, praying that God will dash their babies' heads against the rocks. This is out, this, this makes me uncomfortable but it makes me uncomfortable because it's a human prayer. It's inside of me too. And I need to get it out. And I need to find a way to deal with the ugly, stinky prayers inside of myself in a safe place. And hopefully in the community called the church, uh, we can do that. 
uh, at the same time, we can invite one another that uh, that person that we're saying that prayer for is also a human being who has a backstory, uh, who has been harmed in their life and is acting out in ways that are unjust, uh, that we see are unjust, uh, but they are also human and need to be healed as well. And so we can pray for that person's healing as we pray for our own healing uh, as well. So I don't, I don't know how to answer that question uh, in a better way. I wish, I wish I, I wish I knew Tim, but that's where I'm at at the moment. We have a question from Terry Christopher. Um, and he would like to ask, uh, he says he understands the interpretive gain of allegory, but he's concerned also that this approach um, sort of loses a connection to the physical and anthrop anthropological world we actually live in. In other words, I'm concerned that if violence is allegorical, then why isn't nonviolence equally allegorical? And don't we need a flesh and blood violence transformed by a flesh and blood nonviolence? Glad you're answering yeah. that question. Not me, yeah. but it's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh yeah, I mean, part of what part of what is so important about the biblical story uh that we can that we can push aside uh is uh is the very real violence that it gets to right away. I mean, within the first six chapters of the Bible, you have this apocalyptic moment, and what is the problem? it's human violence, right? It's, it's people who are at each other's throats. Uh, so violence is a very real problem, uh, in, in the Bible and, uh, to, to make of it, uh, to over spiritualize, uh, the Bible and it's violence is, uh, is very problematic for the reasons that you bring up. I think, I think what the allegorical interpretation also helps me to do is to um to deal with the violence that's inside of myself uh it's it's to help me to see the uh philo philo basically says it like this that the struggle between cain and abel is not just out there it's inside of me too cain is inside of me as the ego parts of me that has sin lurking at my door and god comes to those the cane inside of me and says, you better master this thing. Right. Um, so it's a way of internalizing it and dealing. So instead of like over spiritualizing it, uh, I can, it's, which is an excellent point for me, the allegorical interpretation, uh, makes it real inside of myself, right? This is the internal struggle that I am having. It's like when Jesus says, you know, um, uh, take the log out of your own eye before you take the splinter out of your neighbor's eye. Uh, that's an, that's allegory. Like I don't have a literal log in my eye, uh, but the allegorical log is there. The allegorical cane is inside of me. Um, and I've come to the point where I feel like it's a, a bit violent of me to say, Hey, you've got the you've got the log inside of you too, <laughs> right? It's a way of me to pointing the finger at, at someone else. Um, so like for me, it's, it's, it's more trying to take responsibility for these things inside of myself and inviting other people to take a look and say, Hey, maybe there's the cane inside of you too. And how would you, how would you master that? How would you master the sin that's lurking inside of your door? And how can we do that together? Uh, how can you inspire me to do that? And how can we inspire one another to do that? But yeah, violence in the Bible is very real, uh, and we don't want to over-spiritualize it because violence uh, obviously <laughs> continues to be a problem today. Rene Girard says that we are at an uh, objectively apocalyptic moment uh, in human history where we can destroy the world. How are we going to take responsibility for that sin that is lurking at our door as well? Um, I think it's to point yeah. to point beyond it to Jesus. Uh, as best we can, but right. that that is a question that I will uh, continue to struggle with. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. If I might add, or add it as a follow up, but to the extent Jesus is the person we follow, isn't it in fact the case that whatever might have been that that we can say the allegorical nature works because in fact Jesus comes on earth and fleshes it right, 
oh, and okay. confirms the the actual violence of the Roman Empire into his own nonviolent actual flesh uh, response on the cross and through the Beautiful. resurrection. Beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's also a reminder that uh, the incarnation is a reminder that the world is good, <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know it, the flesh, the body is is good. And how do we treat one another in that way uh, is a way of non spiritualizing it, right? Uh, making it flesh and blood. So yeah, but Ellen, that's that's perfect. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm gonna a couple of comments. Paul uh, reminds us that Richard Rohr says the best criticism of the bad is the practice of the good. And uh, Melanie and Jessica offer, I pour out whatever is on my heart. Expressing violent feelings is nonviolent, uh, I guess, in in my opinion. That's, they did an IMO. I'm a little too old to know what IMO means, so I think I got it, though. Um, Mara reminds us that the one organization working for nonviolent political dialogues between people on the right and the left it is braverangels.org. Oh, good. Uh, Diane says, there's no church like yours in my area. How can I find a more progressive church that teaches nonviolence and love and acceptance for all? I think if you stick with us, Diane, and I know you certainly, uh, Adam has invited you, all of us, to uh, at least hop on his church. But there are more progressive denominations, United Church of Christ sometimes is. Um, I belong to Christian Church Disciples of Christ, but maybe Adam will have a quicker answer than I would. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know where you are. Uh, and this may help some of you. I don't know where you all are on this. Uh, I tend to recommend people go to gaychurch.org. Uh, and if you put in your zip code, it will bring up um, open and affirming congregations. Um, that's the closest thing to a search engine for a progressive church that's like mine uh, that I know of. So that that might help you. I don't know. And they are out there. Like I started my questioning, it's just hard to find because the noise is so loud above it. Yeah. So Paul asks, this question is crucial, I think, about the anthropological. I prefer an anthropological reading of Deuteronomy 7 to the allegorical. It's it's understanding that the nonviolent God is on a journey with us to be human in a way, a new way. Deuteronomy 7's genocide is the way of being human that God is leading us away from. It is commanded by the gods of violence, not by the God of, I think that means Jesus. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. I, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Um, violence is a human problem and um violence inside of me is a problem uh that i need to continue to deal with and uh the anthropological fact of that is not something that i would ever deny um the allegorical interpretation that the early christians gave were a way of helping us i mean i i guess i guess part of the point that i want to leave you all with is that the uh, the violence that's attributed to God in the Bible is something that has troubled Christians throughout our history. Um, and it's a very real violence. Uh, and how have Christians learned how to deal with it in partly uh, in ways that... Um, look at the violence that's with side of ourselves. Uh, I think that's also a very, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I, I may just be naive, but I don't know if I'm seeing a really hard dichotomy between the allegorical and the anthropological. For me, when I look at the allegorical interpretations, it's an invitation to say, Hey, this isn't, this isn't just out there. It's within each of us too. And how are we going to take responsibility for it? But Paul, you may know, far more about how this all works than I do. Um, but either way, I, it's all good. So, so I'm going to invite some folks to uh, continue to ask some questions. There's been a good sharing of ways in which people can find 
uh, uh, more progressive churches than they um, might otherwise have uh, been aware of. Um, and so while I'm, uh, hold on just a second. Okay, uh, J. Allen Cross, great talk. As an ex-Catholic, the fear of God has been deeply instilled in me. I would like to approach my relationship with God from more spiritual than religious direction. But I find myself very afraid that a non-traditional approach won't be received well by God. Any advice? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, just give me a minute. Just give me one second. Um, and thank you uh, for putting that question out there because I, I think it's a concern people can have. I, I was uh, raised Catholic, so there was a great deal of trepidation in the beginning to move myself to a Protestant denomination and in fact become ordained by one. So I kind of understand that kind of embedded sensibility that's difficult to um, unwind. Let's put it that way. Oh, Faith, you are here. Good to see you, Faith. Always good to see you. Um, who was it that asked that question? This is uh, J. Allen Cross. Jay, um, I, one of the great things about that I've learned from James Allison in his book, Jesus, the Forgiving Victim, is that he says that faith is, how does he say it? Faith is uh, learning how to relax into the love of God. And uh, I, I think that you're, that's what you're doing, Jay. <laughs> that's what you're doing. Uh, you may get some, a little bit of, uh, you may get some backlash from folks um, for the way that you are moving, um, but you are, the way that you're talking, you are, I'm, I'm hearing you live out this principle that is in uh, 1 John, and you've probably heard it before. First John 4, 18, where it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. We usually stop there, but continue reading uh, because it says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So I would just invite you, Jay, and, and the rest of you to let that sink in um, because perfect love is not about punishment. This is the much of the religious uh, messaging that we have been given throughout our lives. It's, it's my, it, it's my, uh, it's my base <laughs> that I need to continue to unlearn is that if I don't do things right, God is going to punish you. Right. But God is perfect love. And there is no punishment in that love. Uh, Paul um, beautifully uh, quoted Richard Rohr before, uh, and Richard Rohr has been so helpful for many of us as a reminder um, that God always comes to you in the spirit of love, right? I forget exactly how he words it, but uh, it has, has to do with the atonement where Jesus did not come to change God's mind about us. <laughs> Jesus came to change our mind about God. That even when we even when we abandon, betray, kill God in the flesh, God comes back to us and offers not punishment, not fear, uh, but love back to us. And uh, it's something, Jay, that I have to continue to unlearn because it's so deeply embedded inside of me. Uh, but fortunately, we have uh, people to remind us. Um, Paul is one of those. Richard Rohr is one of those. And you good people at Theology and Peace uh, are always pointing us in that direction too. So, And I, I really appreciate that um, we're also communicating between each other and uh, offering support uh, to these comments. And um, uh, Jay Allen Cross has said thank you. And I, I appreciate some of the others who have jumped into this conversation as well. Now, I'm surprised you Theology and Peace people haven't come up with a trick question for Adam. 
but uh, please um, uh, feel free to do so. Um, I would love it if you went back to, well, we don't have a question on board, um, because I have been influenced by James Alice as, as well. And one of the first things you've said, and you said it in your book as well, is God desires mercy. Um, so maybe if you could expand on that a little bit, I think that also, uh, it's not just this allegorical definition, but there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that, that supports that. That's literally said in the Bible, right? Uh, God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Um, yeah, yeah, that comes straight out of the prophet Hosea, um, uh, which is a, if you go read the prophet Hosea, you'll find it's very troubling. <laughs> it's a very troubling book uh, that deals with, the very real violence that is in our world. Uh, and out of it, uh, Hosea comes up with this statement that God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Uh, Jesus is within the prophetic tradition uh, when he lifts that quote up and uh, some of his opponents come to him and uh, they uh, ask him questions basically about interpretation. Uh, and Jesus says, go learn what this means, uh, that God desires mercy and not sacrifice. Uh, that is um, a way of those of us who are familiar with Rene Girard. Girard says that the Bible is a uh, text in travail. It's got basically, uh, in a nutshell, it has two different voices in it. Uh, the sacrificial voice uh, that we see in Joshua chapter seven, um, uh, that leads to violence. Uh, but it also has another voice, the, uh, God of mercy voice, uh, that leads to loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Uh, this is not something that Jesus makes up. It's one of the few passages in Leviticus that Jesus quotes positively, <laughs> Jesus will quote other passages from Leviticus, like uh, you have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's straight out of Leviticus. But I say to you, uh, uh, we're not doing that anymore, <laughs> right? But Jesus quotes Leviticus positively when in Leviticus chapter 19, it says, uh, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. What we miss out of Leviticus 19 when we stop quoting there is that it says, and you shall not bear a, you shall not seek revenge against your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is right there in the Hebrew scriptures. So one of the, one of the dangers of the kind of Christianity that I have found myself in, uh, call it progressive Christianity or whatever, is that sometimes we take the Marcion solution, which is to just say, God of the Bible, God of the Old Testament is a God of anger and wrath. Jesus is the God of love. Well, that's not true. Uh, you have God's love. And I try to show this in my ebook uh, with some stories where God is shown in the Hebrew scriptures as loving God's enemies, as loving our enemies, <laughs> right? Working on their behalf. You find this throughout the Hebrew scriptures. So when Jesus says, love your enemies as you love yourself, he is not going against his Jewish tradition, he is firmly rooted right within it. Um, and so uh, the Bible as a text in travail has these two voices, uh, one of sacrifice, which is violence against another, and one of mercy, uh, which is God's steadfast love. God is, what is the statement? God is slow to anger uh, and love, steadfast love. Uh, I forget exactly how it goes, but uh, somebody can Google it and put it in the chat. Um, but that's that's the God of, that's the teasing out of the human understanding of God that is happening in the Bible. Uh, and it's true. Um, that's why the early Christians didn't want to get rid of the uh, Hebrew scriptures, because it reveals the truth about humans in all of our ugly, violent mess, right? Uh, and it tries to help us deal with our ugly, violent mess in uh, better ways. Um, also by telling us the truth about how we project it onto God at the same time. So so Paul uh, wants to say, I love the basic point in your book, Adam, about letting go of the Bible as the word of God. I've never quite come to that, but I think it's time. Thank you so much for presenting tonight. Tim 
refers to the Bible as the manger that holds Christ, according to Martin Luther. That's from a good uh, Lutheran pastor. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, one one other thing in um, thank you for that, Paul. I go back and forth on it too. Um, uh, one of the things that Brad Jersak says in um, a more Christ-like word uh, is that he's talking with his mentor, who's this older Eastern Orthodox man with his big giant beard. And uh, Brad goes to him and he's talking about like uh, Moses commanding violence against someone. And Brad goes to him and says, um, that's God. How That's God in the Bible demanding violence because that's in the Bible. And his mentor, this Eastern Orthodox priest, points his finger at Brad and says, uh, that's not God. That's Moses. Those are the words of Moses, not the words of God. And uh, I don't know how to how to tease that out in any other way other than to say that uh, Jesus is is the word. Jesus comes to show us what God is like, the nonviolent God who refuses to kill his enemies, but would rather take that upon himself. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, some of our Girardian friends, uh, um, that we're very close to read the book and they were like, I don't know about getting rid of this word of God thing. <laughs> there are other ways of <laughs> interpreting it. And one of those ways might be, you know, holding on to finding other forms of interpretation um, that might be helpful in holding on to it. But, you know, I started off trying to say that th these are the words of Moses, uh, specifically when it came to divorce. And are there other places where it's the words of Moses and not the words of God? Um, that's one example of how that, that can come through whenever Moses says, God wants us to be violent. Um, those are the words of Moses, not the words of God. And we know because Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is. So we have some other people thanking you, Pat Palmer, for the inspiring presentation. Um, so I guess I keep getting to ask the questions. I, what I, the other thing I was thinking about, and I think it reminded me um, when uh, we were having the chat with some folks beforehand, and I heard someone say uh, difficulties in congregations trying to play the middle because we many progressive pastors are assigned or, or selected by churches who are not with them yet. And I think one of the things I really uh, enjoyed watching your growth with your church is how are you doing that? What did you face? You obviously have people following you on to uh, Zoom here. What uh, comments or encouragements might you give to the pastors and others who are on this call about moving this theological, historical thought of we live in a nonviolent Christianity into our congregations and into the world. Um, uh, what worked for you? I yeah. <laughs> uh, what worked for me? Um, I, I would say I, um, I was, I was very lucky, uh, to be at a church that, um, has supported me from day one with these messages. Uh, sometimes I, sometimes I get a little political on the sign and, uh, you may remember, uh, one recent president who called a woman horse face, uh, and I put up on the sign to be clear, no woman should be called horse face. And instantly, uh, people came down, uh, one person very upset with me for being political. Um, and I was like, how, how are we living in a world where saying that nobody should be called horse face is political. <laughs> like this is so obviously moral and messed up that we are, that we're doing this. Um, mm -hmm. and then other people came down, but I, I, I got so freaked out and I called some of my members and they were like, um, keep doing it, keep posting it. So I am very lucky, uh, when it comes to this, that's not to say that, uh, Clackamas where the church is, is the most 
purple slash red uh, in Portland, in the Portland area. So we get our fair share of, mm -hmm. of uh, criticism uh, in the area, but I'm lucky that my church um, has come along. I, I would say this, um, I, I think that, I think the impulse, you know, so much, so much has been given to uh, the word deconstruction. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a lot to deconstruct from within Christian tradition so that we can do better, but I, there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on, um, on reconstruction. Uh, it get back, it get back, it gets back to the question of, um, how do we not get trapped into rivalries? Mm -hmm. So I think that what I would, I think what I would suggest and what I try to do is to try to continually point to the beauty that I see within Christ, to the beauty that I see within the Christian tradition. Um, why is it that as a progressive Christian, I happen to love the Trinity? I happen to love the incarnation because I think it is such a beautiful message about God's love and God's love for the world. Um, and maybe like just keeping to God is love. And uh, some sometimes people say you don't talk about repentance enough in your progressive churches. Well, actually, we do. Um, I, repentance is uh, changing our minds about God. <laughs> That's what metanoia means, right? And whenever I get in my mind that God is something other than love, or God is love, but also He's going to get my enemies. I have to go through a metanoia, a repentance, um, you know, and sometimes that can, that can come out, uh, in very negative ways when I interact with people, especially people online. Uh, and I have to remind myself, um, about my true self, uh, my God given self and about their God given self too. And how do you keep the message for what you are for, uh, and not what you are against, I think is is the best is often the best we can do. And if that's the best we can do, that's, that's pretty awesome <laughs> in this mm -hmm. world, especially when, you know, we've got members of our congregation who aren't there yet. Um, mm -hmm. Continuing to point to God's love in whatever way that you can uh, and how we don't live into it sometimes and how we do live into it sometimes um, is, I guess, the best answer that I can come up with. Thank you. Um, uh, this talk has obviously had a lot of influence. Barbara notes that the movement to ban Bible in certain settings because the focus on horrific incidents in the Bible is certainly becoming more prevalent. Your work is very helpful in dealing with this. Um, Melanie and Jessica say get a sign for the road. Uh, at the end of every scripture reading, in the this is from Mark Dean. At the end of every scripture reading in the Catholic Mass, we hear word of the Lord. I don't hear this as meaning that this reading is to be taken as a literal word of God, but rather as a listen up. God is speaking to us here. The preacher's task is to help understand just what God may be saying to us at the time in this word. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. gets back to uh, Paul's statement about um, not being there, giving up the word of God as the Bible. Um, and, and I like where, I like where you're going with that in the liturgy um, and that not necessarily being the word of God. Um, but, and, and I don't want to say, but, but, and um, where in those troubling passages might we find the word of God made flesh, right? Where in those troubling, violent passages might the word of God be? Uh, it's often it's, it's with the victim. Uh, it's, it's with the one who suffers religious violence. Um, that's the, maybe that's where I've been trying to train my mind to find, uh, the word of God in some of these horrific passages. Um, so, and sometimes, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, some of our Girardian friends say that, um, you know, after uh, Abel's Abel gets killed and his blood is on the ground and his blood cries out. And in Genesis, it doesn't say anything more than that. Um, but in, I think it's Hebrews, uh, the letter to the Hebrews in the new Testament, it says that, uh, Christ's blood 
calls out for a better thing than Abel's blood, uh, something like that. And uh, so that's been a way of interpreting Abel's blood as crying out for vengeance against someone else, right? But even there, Abel is a Christ-like figure uh, because he's the one who suffers from this violence. Uh, he's the victim. You know, this is where uh, um, uh, our um, our liberation theologians come in so importantly in the Exodus story, right? Uh, God hears the cry of the victim. And this is where like, even our, even our sweaty, ugly, smelly, dirty socks prayers that are about vengeance uh, come in, right? Um, God hears even those uh, and seeks to transform them. It's like um, when Joseph's brothers uh, leave him for dead. And at the end, Joseph says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And it's not that God was there in the brothers leaving him for dead, but it's that what Paul says, that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Where my sin abounds, where my dirty, ugly prayers abound, <laughs> hopefully God's grace abounds all the more, inviting me to live into that grace um, more than I have before. Uh, and so Joseph sees that God has been working in his life, uh, to overcome even the horrible things that happened to him afterwards, he's able to see how God has been helping him the whole time, overcome it to do something better, um, than what he was given, uh, in the past. So. Oh, Mark, I love this. God has no enemies, only children, all who are beloved and cherished by God. Only we have enemies whom we have not have yet to learn that they are first of all siblings. Oh, Mark, that's beautiful. Thank you for yeah. that. And uh, Suzanne, I'm going to give you the last question. And then before I do so, I have to make a ridiculous plug, which is if you would ever like to see Adam in person or you want to join us by Zoom, uh, be there on uh, October 5th to 8th. Check out theologyandpeace.org and we can continue these conversations. Suzanne asked, Adam, can you talk more about how God, how to understand God's wrath? Um, in our work with people trying to live nonviolently in violent contexts, they feel themselves to be targets of very human wrath. And we'll let you have the last word. Good, good. Yeah, thank you for that, Suzanne. I uh, I was, that was one direction where I thought that I might take this talk actually, uh, understanding God's wrath and how it gets transformed throughout, uh, the Bible at our Bible study, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Job got brought up, uh, and at the end of Job, uh, God, um, God says that Job was right the whole time declaring his innocence and that Job's friends were wrong. And it says that God's wrath was kindled against Job's friends. Uh, and so what does God's wrath do? <laughs> Fire and brimstone on Job's friends, right? No. <laughs> what does God do? This is the, this is how you see God's wrath being transformed throughout the Bible. Instead of God acting violently out of God's wrath, wrath means like an anger that you can't control, an anger that just uses violence against someone. And instead of that, what that passage in Job says is that God goes to Job's friends and his wrath is burned against Job's friends. And God says, just perform some sacrifices. Job will pray for you. And then my wrath is gone. <laughs> Right. I mean, how unwrathful of a wrathing is that? <laughs> right. You still have like animal sacrifice, which, by the way, is a click forward in uh, human sacrifice. Right. And then you get to the prophets who say that um, God doesn't desire sacrifice at all uh, and is moving us more towards mercy. But that's one example of the Old Testament uh, where you see wrath getting transformed getting uh, moved into a different direction. It, yeah, it was uh, that John Cassian quote where it says, uh, you can't, it is blasphemy to uh, interpret God's wrath literally, 
the first time I read that from somebody in the fourth and fifth century, whoa, what is that getting at, right? Um, wrath in the New Testament, where Paul picks up on wrath. Interesting, there's there's only one place in the Gospels that I'm aware of where it talks about God's wrath, and it's in John chapter three, near the end. And uh, I forget exactly what it says, but it's another example of where, like Job, where uh, God's wrath is going to be kindled, but it, there's no violence with it. <laughs> there's no violence with God's wrath. It's a it's a kind of a deconstruction of the concept of divine wrath. Paul gets into this too, and I, our friend Paul Nectarline um, knows this much better than I do in in Romans. Uh, Paul's done such great work on it. Um, but Paul talks about God's wrath in uh, chapter one. And what is God's wrath? It's people getting the consequences of their actions. Like God, it's very secular. Like it's, you've chosen to live this way and this is what's going to happen. Uh, it's a very secularization of divine wrath. Now there's been a lot of, uh, Douglas Campbell has done a lot of work on Romans one and is, is, um, Paul actually saying that about God's wrath or is that Paul's enemy saying that about, um, about God's wrath and Paul comes later to deconstruct it in, uh, Romans chapter two, uh, where, uh, the, there's one faction, uh, the, um, Jewish Christians are, um, uh, Let's see, how does, how does this go? James Allison says uh, that in Romans chapter one, uh, Paul is getting the Jewish Christians all riled up against the Gentile Christians and how awful the Gentile Christians are acting and uh, God's wrath is against them. And yay, isn't that great, uh, Jewish Christians? And then in Romans chapter two, uh, which we typically don't read, Paul says, uh, and you're doing the same exact things. So he puts everybody on the hook. Uh, this gets to Romans uh, chapter five, where Paul says, uh, all have sinned under Adam and all have made alive in Christ. Um, so we all have this way of it just gets back to the Roman church and every church, unfortunately, where there are factions within it and one faction against another. And Paul is trying to help people to see, even when you're talking about uh, God's wrath kindled against them, well, whatever it is, it might be kindled against us too. And uh, fortunately, God's wrath is, uh, over time in the New Testament, seen as suffering the consequences of our own actions. Now, doesn't stop there, because the Christian faith is not about karma. Uh, there is a human element to it that we've been talking about, where uh, sometimes our actions come and bite us in the butt, right? But the ultimate truth is... What else is in John chapter one, that the word became flesh and in him, we received grace upon grace, right? So there is, that's, that's the kind of transformation of what wrath is doing in the Hebrew scriptures and in the new Testament, uh, where it becomes much more about our suffering, the consequences of our own actions and behind all of it is grace upon grace, which is what God is truly like. Well, thank you, Adam. And I'm being reminded we're out of time. I don't know if that means Zoom's going to make us all disappear like that. <laughs> but um, you have got many accolades. I send you accolades and your gracious time that you've spent with us tonight. And it reminds us we can continue to work our, our love out into the world. Everybody who knows how to use that reactions give them a love sign or a uh, applause sign on your thing and uh thank you so much adam for all, all right all right well thank you ellen you did you're fantastic welcome. you did so okay. great with all of those questions so thank you for that you're welcome yes awesome. my awesome. pleasure actually good thank um you. i look thank forward you. to seeing you in october me too it's gonna be awesome so <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Wes, and thank you, everybody at Theology and Peace. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Appreciate you, my friend. Good to see you. Love Can't you all. See, see you. Thanks. All right, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Good night. Good night. Bye.